Hello everybody, Shrouded Hand here. I want to talk about a murder that happened in 2016 quite close to where I live in the northeast of England. Maybe I've just missed it but I haven't seen it getting spoken about much and as you'll see it's got some extremely disturbing details. So this is the murder of James Prout. To understand this murder we have to look at the circumstances surrounding it and the close-knit lives of a small group of people. James Prout, known as Jimmy to his friends, was a vulnerable adult with learning difficulties. At one point his life had been fairly normal, he was in a committed relationship and he'd fathered two children. Early photographs show him looking healthy and happy. However, in 2006 his relationship ended and Jimmy Prout's life descended into one of homelessness and petty crime. It was most likely around this time that he met Zahid Zaman at the People's Kitchen, this is the soup kitchen in Newcastle city centre. Zahid Zaman modelled himself as a pillar of the community, an animal lover and a friend of the downtrodden. In actual fact he was a manipulative, sadistic egotist with a penchant for bestiality porn. He volunteered at the People's Kitchen and it was here that he trawled for vulnerable people to take advantage of. He was in a wheelchair from a car accident years before but apparently this was mostly for appearances. He was often witnessed jumping up out of his chair to run for a bus or to carry furniture. He lived at 35 St Stephen's Way in Percy Main, North Shields. His neighbours knew him as a bit of a troublemaker. After moving into the property he'd fitted multiple CCTV cameras to the house and he used this to spy on people coming and going up and down the street. He had a habit of calling the police on his neighbours for extremely petty reasons, often making up stuff just to get them into trouble. He was also known for going around in his wheelchair with a body mounted camera trying to goad people into getting into an argument with him. He would then use this footage to report them for harassment. Essentially he was a cry bully. He lived with a woman called Kay Rayworth. Rayworth owned the property at number 35 and she had been quite involved with the local community, volunteering and taking part in the church choir. However, after her husband left in 2004, the now isolated Rayworth turned to drink and began using internet dating sites to meet men for casual sex. It was through one of these dating sites that she met Zahid Zaman and he moved into her home in 2007. After moving in, Kay Rayworth's friends noticed a change in her. She became isolated and withdrawn, she stopped taking part in community activities and seemed to lose her outgoing personality. Behind the scenes, Zaman was slowly taking control of her life. He would fly into fits of rage, threatening to beat her with a hammer. He stopped her children from visiting the house and he put cardboard over the windows to stop people seeing inside. Kay Rayworth also owned a property around the corner, number 75 St Stephen's Way and she rented it out. At some point, although the timeline is a bit unclear here, Jimmy Prout met a woman named Anne Corbett at the soup kitchen. The two of them started a relationship and moved in together at number 75. In 2009, Zahid Zaman met a woman called Myra Wood on Facebook. They developed a relationship and in 2013 she also moved into number 75. Similar to Kay Rayworth, Myra Wood's family noticed a change in her after she got involved with Zahid Zaman. He had set about systematically isolating and controlling her just like he did with Rayworth. So to recap, because this is a bit of a convoluted situation, we have Zahid Zaman who is no longer in a relationship with Kay Rayworth but still living with her at number 35. He's now going out with Myra Wood who's living at number 75 with Anne Corbett and Jimmy Prout. The five of them form this weird, almost cult-like gang with Zaman as the leader. Some headlines have called them the North Shields death cult but I don't know if the word cult is completely accurate. As far as I can tell they didn't follow any particular belief or ideology, but they do have some of the characteristics present in this are you in a cult checklist. Like, the group is focused on a living leader to whom the members seem to display excessively zealous unquestioning commitment. 
and members' subservience to the group causes them to cut ties with family and friends and to give up personal goals and activities that were of interest before joining the group. Also, members are encouraged or required to live and or socialise only with other group members. And most importantly, the group teaches or implies that its supposedly exalted ends justify means that members would have considered unethical before joining the group. Jimmy Prout's role in this gang was basically the dog's body. He was constantly made to run errands and do odd jobs for the rest of the group. It seems that in the hierarchy of the gang, he was at the very bottom. It also looks like he became the group's scapegoats. The women of the group, fearful of violent repercussions from Zaman, would pass the blame for their own transgressions down to the lowest member of the gang. As violence and abuse became normalised within the group, they would have taken their own frustrations and fears out on Jimmy. Jimmy Prout lost a huge amount of weight during his time at St. Stephen's Way. I don't know whether he was deliberately starved. Food restriction is another method of control within cults. It could have just been caused by the poverty and the stress of the situation, but photographs of him in 2015 show a shocking change from his earlier life. 2015 would see a serious escalation in the violence. Zahid Zaman had developed a burning hatred for Anne Corbett's brother, Ivan. Possibly this was because Ivan was seen as an outsider to their gang. He would occasionally stay at number 75 with his sister, but he wasn't part of the core group. Zaman accused Ivan Corbett of stealing tools from him. Ivan had moved out of number 75, so none of the gang could actually get hold of him. Instead, they directed their anger at Jimmy Prout, accusing him of not doing enough to help them recover the stolen items. He became the target of an escalating series of attacks. It's not known who exactly administered these beatings. Later, when questioned, the gang members would all blame one another in an attempt to absolve themselves of responsibility. Sometime in mid-November 2015, Jimmy was severely beaten and stabbed. He didn't seek medical help until the 27th of November when he attended the North Tyneside General Hospital. The doctor who treated him said he had bruises to his arms, head, face, legs and back and he had stab wounds to his left shoulder, left upper arm and scrotum. His left shoulder was also fractured. The stab wounds to his scrotum seemed to be a prelude to a much more gruesome attack that would come later and a sign perhaps that the violence was becoming sexual in nature. On the 30th of November, Jimmy posted a number of photographs of his battered face and body to Facebook, a desperate cry for help that seems to have been ignored. My mouth hurt, my body hurt, my shoulder hurts. Over the following few months, Jimmy Prout was subjected to increasingly depraved punishments and degradations at the hands of his so-called friends. He was strangled and had a glass bottle smashed over his head. His teeth were smashed from his jaw using a hammer and chisel. On one sickening occasion, he was made to lie on the floor whilst Zaman's dogs raped him. And this probably wasn't even the worst thing they did to him. One day, they held Jimmy down while somebody sliced open his scrotum with a Stanley knife and removed one of his testicles. They then cooked his testicle by boiling it in water and forced him to eat it. A number of CCTV clips taken from number 35 show Jimmy Prout's deteriorating condition as the torture escalated. This one was filmed in October of 2015, so it must have been before the worst of the abuse started. Jimmy seems to be walking around looking relatively healthy here. Now look at this footage from just four months later. This was filmed on the 5th of February 2016. It shows Anne Corbett pushing a distressed and dishevelled Jimmy Prout towards number 35 St. Stephen's Way. I'm not sure which of the abuses had been done to him at this point, but he appears to be in tremendous pain and having trouble walking. They were filmed again a few hours later. Again, Anne Corbett is escorting him towards number 35. 
This time Jimmy Prout looks to be having difficulty staying upright and he stumbles against the fence for support. The following day, they're seen again. This time, Kay Rayworth and Anne Corbett are escorting Jimmy Prout to number 35, holding on to him like a prisoner. noticed the expression on his face, the face of a man being taken to the torture chamber. At around quarter to ten that night, the gang are seen leaving the property. Kay Rayworth aggressively grabs Prout in the process, and here comes their god emperor. I mean, you know you're fucked up in life when this guy's your leader. They're seen walking up the streets and here Jimmy Prout appears to collapse and the gang seems to lift him to his feet and drag him onwards. Three days after this footage was filmed, James Jimmy Prout was dead. The exact details of his final moments are unclear, again nobody wanted to admit what happened and all seemed to blame each other. At 5.02am on February the 9th, Myra Wood texts Zahid Zaman saying, That bastard had me awake all fucking night, referring to Jimmy Prout. It seems that, at some point in the early hours of that morning, in order to muffle Jimmy Prout's cries of agony, somebody tied a pair of trousers around his face like a gag. When the gag was removed, he was dead. Half an hour after the text message was sent, Kay Rayworth and Zahid Zaman were seen taking an empty wheelchair from the garage and wheeling it in the direction of number 75. 35 minutes later they returned without the wheelchair. At number 75, the group had dressed Jimmy's corpse and wrapped it in two sleeping bags. Then, using the wheelchair, they wheeled his body to some nearby waste ground and dumped it there. I'm not sure of the precise location, but the newspapers describe it as a waste ground barely 100 metres from number 75 and next to the A187. I believe that puts it somewhere in this area. From number 75, there's a wheelchair accessible route that goes under the 187 and emerges in this area, so I imagine that this is the route that they took his body. Later that night, they had a bonfire in the garden of number 75. Most likely they were burning evidence that linked them to the murder. In the days following the killing of Jimmy Prout, the four remaining members of the group made a real show of asking around the neighbourhood to see if anyone had seen Jimmy, feigning concern at his sudden absence. At some point they even returned to Jimmy's body to steal his bank card, which they used to withdraw money from his bank account on a number of separate occasions. The body remained undetected for over a month, but something changed in the group dynamic around the end of March. It's been speculated that Anne Corbett was threatening to go to the police, or at least they suspected that she would, and so they hatched a plan to frame her as being solely responsible for the murder. On the 25th of March, Zaman called the police, sounding like he was in a state of shock. He said that Anne Corbett had attacked him. He then handed the phone to Kay Rayworth, who confirmed what Zaman was saying. Police came to number 35 to speak with Zahid Zaman and he handed them three sheets of paper. He said that Anne Corbett had attacked him with a hammer and in the ensuing struggle she had dropped these papers. When Zaman read them later, he realised that it was a handwritten letter in which Corbett confessed to killing Jimmy Proud. The police weren't fooled by Zaman's story. The next day, Zaman, Wood and Rayworth were all arrested. 
On the 27th, Corbett was also brought in for questioning. That same day, police found Jimmy's body on the wasteland. During interrogations, all four members of the group attempted to throw one another under the bus whilst minimising their own involvement in the murder. As further evidence was presented, their stories and excuses changed as they attempted to wheedle their way out of the blame. It made it impossible for police to deduce exactly who inflicted which injuries and who dealt the killing blow. It was decided that Anne Corbett and Zahid Zaman were definitely present when Prout was killed and so they were both found guilty of his murder. Zaman, as the ringleader of the group, was given life with a minimum of 33 years. Corbett was given life with a minimum of 27 years. For some reason it wasn't as easy to prove that Myra Wood and Kay Rayworth were present at his death. They were found guilty of causing or allowing the death of a vulnerable adult, but cleared of murder or manslaughter. Now, I don't really understand how you can be guilty of causing someone's death, but not guilty of manslaughter or murder. I guess that's why I'm not a lawyer. Rayworth was given 12 years imprisonment, Wood got 9 years, although those numbers don't really mean anything, as 5 years later, Wood and Rayworth were both released. You torture a disabled man to death and basically get a slap on the wrist. And so, there you go. A depressing story with a depressing ending, and I hope I thoroughly spoilt your day. Now, actually, I hope you find the video interesting. I'm glad to be able to cover this case because, as I say, it's a local tragedy and I, f I find these cases interesting just because I kind of know the area so I can picture it a little bit more and as far as I can tell this story didn't get the coverage it deserves. Perhaps I've just missed it but I haven't seen many people talking about this case. So a big thanks to everyone for watching and to everyone who is helping keep the channel going. As always, it's much appreciated. Oh and I should add because a lot of people have been asking me this. If someone in the comments claims to be me and asks you to join some telegram group so they can send you a PS5 or a MacBook or something, it's definitely a scam. Please don't fall for it. Anyway, thank you for watching. Until next time, goodbye.